Britain Stands Alone, 1940. At the year, end of the year of 1940, Britain will find themselves as the only European country to stand up against Nazi Germany, Blitzkrieg of Western Europe. The invasion of Norway and Denmark. On April 9, 1940, the rapid invasion of the northern Scandinavian nations revealed how ill-prepared Europe was for war. Copenhagen fell within 12 hours. A British-French force attempted to aid Norway, but was withdrawn by May 2nd. Britain would occupy Iceland May 9th to prevent its fall to Germany. On June 9th, the King of Norway ended the fighting against Germany, and on June 11th, Denmark also succumbed to Germany. The invasion of the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium began on May 10th. Neville Chamberlain's government collapsed after Germany invaded these nations, elevating to Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who had warned of German war preparations. Between the 14th and 15th of May, the Dutch government fled in exile to London while its army surrendered. King Leopold III of Belgium surrendered. The Battle of Dunkirk, May 26th to June 4th. In one of the most widely debated decisions in the war, the Germans halted their advance on Dunkirk. Contrary to popular belief, which became the halt order, did not originate with Adolf Hitler. Gerhard von Rundstedt and Gunther von Klug suggested that the German forces around the Dunkirk pocket should cease their advance on the port and consolidate to avoid the Allied break. Hitler sanctioned the order on May 24th with the support of uh, the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht and the army was to halt for three days, giving the Allies time to organize an evacuation and build a defensive line. Despite the Allies' gloomy estimates of the situation, with Britain discussing a conditional surrender to Germany, in the end, over 330,000 Allied troops were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk. This was called Operation Dynamo. Churchill's famous radio speech on June 1st of We Shall Fight on the Beaches and the Landing Grounds encouraged British resistance to Germany. France Falls The Maginot Line was France's great defensive line built along its common boundary with Germany. German troops bypassed the line going through Belgium to invade France by going through the Ardennes uh, like they did in the Great War on June the 5th. The French government, seeing what had happened to the other European capitals, Warsaw, Copenhagen, Brussels, being destroyed by the Luftwaffe, wanted to avoid the same thing to happen to their beloved Paris, and so they surrendered. To add insult to injury, Hitler ordered representatives of the French government to sign the document of surrender in the same railway car that the Germans signed the armistice ending World War I. On June 14th, German troops entered Paris. The instrument of surrender set up a Vichy, unoccupied France, led by Marshal Henri Philippe Pétain, headed by the government of France. Pétain would establish a pro-Nazi puppet government. A French government in exile in London was led by General Charles de Gaulle. Britain now remained the only Western power to oppose Adolf Hitler. The Axis Powers In September of 1940, Germany, Italy, and Japan would meet in Berlin to sign the official alliance creating the Axis powers. Although miffed at Germany for its non-aggressive pact with Stalin, initially almost immediate successes of Germany and Europe rekindled interest in Japan for better relations with Berlin. Articles in the tripartite pact included Article 3, specifically aimed at the United States. It basically said that Germany, Italy, Japan agreed to assist one another with all political, economic, and military means if one of the three contacting powers is attacked by the power at present not involved in the European war or in the Chinese-Japanese conflict, which at that time was the United States. Article 5 specifically excluded the Soviet Union. So in other words, if a war would occur between one of the Axis power and the Soviet Union, the other two were not inclined to declare war on the Soviet Union. The Battle of Britain would take place from July 10th to October 31st, 1940. Having conquered France and nations to the north, 
Hitler launched an air attack against Britain to soften them up in the preparation of a German invasion across the channel, codenamed Operation Sea Lion. Goring had convinced Hitler that the Luftwaffe would be able to destroy the Royal Air Force and that the Allies will never drop one bomb on Berlin. The Luftwaffe was somewhat successful on the coast in an attempt to knock out airfields in a new weapon of war, radar installations. However, they accidentally would strike a British city. Churchill's response was to bomb Berlin. And this is what happened. And Hitler would change the tactics because he was enraged and then orders the bombing of British cities, mostly London and Manchester, the city that gave birth to the Industrial Revolution. London. King George V and Queen Elizabeth refused to leave London when the Queen was approached by a young British officer trying to implore her to leave Buckingham Palace. Her response was, my dear young man, the only thing you need to teach me is how to use that weapon of yours so I can kill those bastards when they arrive. Their presence in London during the Blitz was a huge morale boost for the Londoners. The British had broken the German code and discovered the target for their bombing was Coventry. Churchill had to make a gut-wrenching decision. Do you let Coventry be bombed or do you evacuate the population? If you decide to evacuate the population, German spies could have discovered that the German secret code had indeed been broken. Churchill decided to let Coventry be bombed and use the code for a future use. September 15th was the climax of the Battle of Britain, when 56 German aircraft were destroyed. The end result, the British would lose 915 aircraft during the Battle of Britain, and Germany, according to the records, would lose 1,733. Churchill would attribute the victory in the Battle of Britain to the Royal Air Force, the RAF. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. American Reaction American public opinion polls in 1938 and 19. 40 showed that the American people believed that the nation should fight only if directly attacked. More than 80% of Americans supported continued restrictions on immigration, and most Americans believed that the nation had been wrong to enter the Great War. The collapse of France scared Americans into rearming, and Congress passed laws to expand the army, build planes and ships, and institute the first peacetime draft in United States history. In 1940, FDR established the National Defense Advisory Committee and the Council of National Defense to plan the war preparedness strategy. In the 1940 presidential election, Roosevelt decided to break tradition and run for a third term, believing with the war looming in Europe, the United States needed a strong leader and was prepared. Republicans nominated Wendell Wilkie, one of the biggest problems Wilkie faced is that he actually agreed with all the steps that FDR was taking. Roosevelt was elected to a third term in 1940 very easily. Here we see the map of the Axis Europe in 1941 on the eve of Hitler's invasion to the Soviet Union. After almost two years of war, the Axis powers controlled most of Europe from the Atlantic Ocean to the Soviet border through annexation, military conquest, and new alliances. Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria would join the Axis powers. Failure to force Britain to make peace caused Hitler to look eastward in 1941 to attempt to conquest the Soviet Union. The world turned upside down when we see the entrance of the Soviet Union and the United States on the side of the Allies. The Brink of War the Lend-Lease Act. An act to further promote the defense of the United States. On December 17, 1940, in a fireside chat, FDR proposed what became known as the Lend-Lease, illustrated by his garden hose analogy. Suppose my neighbor's house catches fire, and I have a length of garden hose full of 500 feet away. If he can take my garden hose and connect it up to his hydrant, I may help him put out the fire. 
Now what do I do? I don't say to him before the operation, neighbor, my garden hose cost me fifteen dollars. You have to pay me fifteen dollars for it. What is the transaction that goes on? I don't want fifteen dollars. I want my garden hose back after the fire is over. FDR proposed the U.S. get away from the dollar sign, and we will say to England, we'll give you the guns and the ships you need, provided that when the war is over, you'll return the kind, the guns and the ships that we have loaned to you. The program began in 1941, through which the United States would transfer military equipment to Britain and the other allies of World War II. FDR recommended Lend-Lease to Congress and urged its passage. He also enunciated his four freedom speech, a freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, and freedom from want. On March 11, 1941, Congress approved Lend-Lease with an initial appropriation of $7 billion, just in time for Britain, who had exhausted its credit by purchasing war and materials. Any nation which the president considered threatened and vital to the defense of the United States could receive arms and other supplies or equipment by sale, transfer, exchange, or lease. The Atlantic Charter. Roosevelt and Churchill met secretly off Newfoundland to map out military strategy and post-war goals, and was called the Atlantic Charter, which was formulated and announced on August 14, 1941. The eight principles provided a purpose for fighting war, including a renunciation of all aggression, self-determination of peoples, equal access to raw materials, guarantees for freedom from want and fear, freedom of the seas, disarmament of the aggressor nations, and by September 24th, several anti-Axis nations, including the Soviets, China, Belgium, Norway, Luxembourg, Czechoslovakia, the Netherlands, Poland, Yugoslavia and nine Latin American countries endorsed a plan, which would become the blueprint for the United Nations. The United States decided to build a two ocean navy, which antagonized Japan. The United States was also restricting imports of steel, iron ore, and aluminum to Japan. After the Japanese invaded French Indochina, FDR froze Japanese assets in the United States and blocked all oil imports. The Invasion of the Soviet Union Hitler offered the British a higher role in his reconstructed world if they surrendered, because after all, the British Isles were settled earlier by Germanic tribes. Britain's failure to surrender caused Hitler to make a critical assumption that the British anticipated either Soviet or American help. To counter the United States, Hitler encouraged Japan to move against British holdings in the Far East to divert U.S. attention away from Europe. The invasion was called Operation Barbarossa, was a war of annihilation and conquest. The Nazis had long viewed Eastern Europe as inferior and in long-standing hatred of the communists. Hitler invaded the USSR along a 2,000-mile stretch between Ukraine and the Arctic. The invasion also marked a turning point by pulling the Soviet Union into the war on the Allied side. The Soviet Union would bear the brunt of the fighting against the German front forces. However, the Soviets' determination and supplies sent by the United States in the harsh winter eventually slowed and stopped the German advance. To counter possible Soviet aid, Japan and Italy, because the Tripart Pact excluded the Soviets in Article 5, neither would declare war. Hitler declared that superior Germans did not need the help of half lackward monkeys to defeat the Russians. And so certain of victory, he did not allow his army to take winter gear into the Soviet Union for fear German soldiers might expect winter. On June 24, 1941, the U.S. provided immediate aid to the Soviet Union under Lend-Lease. Rapid advancement, Germans advanced rapidly into the interior of the Soviet Union. By mid-August, they had taken most of the Ukraine. The Ukrainians actually greeted the German army as liberators from Stalin. However, when Goring arrived three days later, he said, that's not going to happen. We're going to kill them all. By mid-September, they had reached Leningrad, and by mid-November, they had reached the outskirts of Moscow. When winter set in, Stalin called for his troops stationed Siberian, used to harsh winter conditions for fighting, and stalled the Nazi advancement. The Day of Infamy 
United States and Japanese relations deteriorated. Japanese aggression against French Indochina in September 1940 resulted in an October U.S. embargo of scrap iron and steel to any nation outside the Western Hemisphere except Great Britain. With Japan's occupation of Indochina in the summer of 1941, FDR froze all Japanese credits in the United States, nationalized forces in the Philippines under General Douglas MacArthur's command, and warned Japan against any further aggressive actions in the East. In October 1941, Hideki Tojo would become Prime Minister of Japan, and they would attack the British and Dutch installations in the East, avoiding confrontation at the U.S. at all costs. By October 1941, signs appeared that Japan might attack a U.S. Pacific possession. After diplomatic meetings to negotiate to an end to Japanese involvement in China broke down, Tojo wanted to go to war. Admiral Yamamoto, the man you see pictured to the left, who had once studied and lived in the United States, was against it. He understood the industrial might and resolve of the United States. His plan, the Japanese government approved, to bomb the U.S. Navy at anchor in Pearl Harbor in the territory of Hawaii and attempt to destroy as much as possible the U.S. naval fleet, force the United States no other choice but to sue for peace. Tensions mount, an undeclared war in the Atlantic. In September 4, 1941, the USS Greer was attacked by a Nazi U-boat. FDR would order U.S. warships to protect convoys all the way to Iceland. And to the many Americans, this was looking just like the repeat that got us involved in World War I, the sinking of U.S. ships by German U-boats. On October 17th, the USS Kearney was sunk, where 11 sailors died. Two weeks later, the USS Reuben James was sunk with 115 souls. Then, tensions with Japan began to increase. By October 1941, signs appeared that Japan might attack a U.S. Pacific possession after diplomatic meetings to negotiate an end to the Japanese involvement in China broke down. Tojo wanted to go to war. Congress would now allow merchant marine ships to be armed and enter into belligerent ports. But as the U.S. said, basically, you need to get out of China or we will not give you any more oil. That was a negotiating point the Japanese would not even consider. November 1941. Admiral Yamamoto, who once studied and lived in the United States, was against it. He understood the industrial might and the resolve in the United States, something his other Japanese counterparts failed to grasp. His plan, the Japanese government approved of, was to bomb the U.S. Navy at anchor in Pearl Harbor. The hopes was to wipe out the entire Pacific fleet. The real target is going to be aircraft carriers. The Japanese understood quicker than anyone else that the future of naval warfare had to deal with aircraft carriers, not battleship. All which were anchored at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. By destroying the naval fleet, the United States, in fear of possibly of a Japanese invasion on the West Coast, would have to sue for peace. On November 5th, Japan demands the United States to end its embargo or face conflict. Secretary of State Cordell Hull responded on November 26th that Japan to remove its troops from China uh, to have the embargo lifted. On November 27th, a volume of radio traffic from observers of the Far East that many other Imperial warships were moving towards the Philippines and the rest of Southeast Asia would enable Harold Stark, the chief of naval operations in Washington, flash the U.S. Navy outpost this very important message in the Pacific. This dispatch is to be considered a war warning. Negotiations with Japan looking toward the stabilization of conditions in the Pacific have ceased and an aggressive move by Japan is expected within the next few days. The number and equipment of Japanese troops and organization of naval task forces indicate the ambitious expedition against either the Philippines, Thai, or Kra Peninsula, or possibly Borneo. Execute an inappropriate defense deployment preparatory to carrying out the task assigned in WPL 46. Left out delivery was any hint of what qualified as a sort of deployment, whether taking ships to sea, 
elevating watch levels, sending protective fighter planes aloft, or something else. That decision was left to its recipients. Fleet commanders had gotten their jobs by demonstrating judgment and leadership, not told step by step what they needed to do. Prepared. So let's see how well prepared the naval and army commands in the Pacific actually were after the war message was sent out. In Manila, Admiral Thomas Charles began to scatter his submarines and his surface ships and began to put to sea. A wise man in this situation, he said, sleeps like a criminal, never twice in the same bed. The Pacific Fleet Admiral, husband E. Kimmel, had received alarming dispatches from Washington about possible Japanese aggression. He had gotten so many, in fact, that the Vice Admiral William F. Halsey, who commanded the fleet carriers and would become a figure of lore in the coming war, called them wolf dispatches. There were many of these, Halsey said, and like everything else that's given in abundance, the senses tended to be dulled. The Navy had long-range sea planes on Oahu, but the PBYs, as the float planes were known, had never been deployed for systematic comprehensive searches of the distant perimeter. They only scoured the operating areas where the fleet participated, usually south of Oahu, as a precaution against a Japanese submarine taking a stealthy peacetime shot during these exercises. Kimmel said, I never saw it, the war warning, in all my naval experience. Likewise, execute an appropriate defensive deployment struck everyone as an odd phrase because, as one officer said, we don't use that term in the Navy. The overall warning message never mentioned Hawaii, only places far away. On the same day as Kimball, Lieutenant General Walter C. Short, the Army commander, got a war warning of his own from Washington. Short opted to guard not against an external threat, but against saboteurs who might be lurking among the thousands of Oahu residents of Japanese descent. An army officer would say afterwards, however, he had always believed that, that we would never have any sabotage trouble with the local Japanese, and we never did. By the end of 1941, Japan had built 10 aircraft carriers, three more than what the United States had. Private George E. Elliott, Jr. and Joseph L. Lockhart manned a new radar station. It sat at Apana, 432 feet above the coast, located in this direction right here. Army headquarters was on the other side of the island, as was the Navy base at Pearl Harbor, and the most important American base in the Pacific. But between the privates and Alaska, 2,000 miles away, there was nothing but wavy liquid, a place, a few shipping lanes, and no islands. An Army general called this the Vacant Sea. At 7 a.m., their device could not tell its operators precisely how many planes the antenna was sensing, or if they were American or military or civilian. But the height of a spike gave a rough indication of the number of aircraft. And this spike did not suggest two or three, but an astonishing number, 50, maybe even more. With no thoughts about an impending war, the men of Pearl stated that their Sunday as usual. They had no reason to be preparing anti-aircraft guns or even to be aboard their ships if they were on leave. And as we could see here, the first wave is going to commence at 7.55 a.m. Now, they did call back to their officer in charge and say, hey, look, we're getting a, a, a huge spike of a planes coming north of the island of Oahu. The lieutenant said, well, hold on a minute, and told him, do not worry about it. Those are B-17s that are probably flying in from the coast. After hearing this last order, the privates closed up their shop and went to breakfast. Unfortunately, the privates did not offer how many planes, nor did the officer ask how many did they possibly see through their radar scope. On December 7th, 1941, at 7.55 a.m. Honolulu time, Japanese bombers launched the sneak attack upon the United States base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, hoping to cripple the U.S. Navy. Japan would sink four battleships, the Arizona, which you see pictured there. 
the California, the Utah, and Oklahoma, and seriously damaged too, the West Virginia and Nevada. 19 ships were sunk or disabled, 170 planes were lost, and 2,403 civilian and military personnel were killed, and 1,178 were wounded. Japan would also launch simultaneous attacks on the Philippines, Wake Island, Guam, Midway Islands, and on the British forces at Hong Kong and in the Malay Peninsula. Not only did the attack catch the U.S. off guard, it also surprised Japan's allies. That evening, Japan announced that it had officially declared war on the United States. Admiral Husband Kimmel, commander at Pearl Harbor, was relieved of command and replaced with Chester Nimitz, commander of the Pacific Fleet. Battle damage and assessment. Japan failed to find or sink any carriers. They knocked out the battle force and decimated the striking air power present, but they neglected permanent installations at Pearl Harbor, including the repair shops, which were able to do an amazing quick job on the less severely damaged ships. Nor did Japan aviators strike at the power plant or the fuel tank farm supplying the naval station and the fleet. Nor did they inflict as many casualties as they might early on a Sunday morning in port, after all. Many crewmen were ashore enjoying some R&R, and thus not in Japanese crosshairs. Of the battleships sunk and damaged, three of the battleships, the USS Pennsylvania, the USS Maryland, and the USS Tennessee, were either returned to service or refloated and steamed to the continental United States for final repairs. The USS Nevada rejoined the active fleet in late 1942 and fought in the Normandy invasion, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. The USS California was refitted and returned to service in 1944. The USS West Virginia, as you see that's ablaze on the top and then uh, fixed on the bottom, would return to fight in 1944 and would end up in Tokyo Bay witnessing the surrender of Japan. A day which will live in infamy. For Yamamoto, the place was Pearl and the time was immediately after an hour or two the Empire submitted a declaration of war. He believed that an honorable samurai does not plunge his sword into a sleeping enemy, but first kicks the victim's pillow so he is awake and then stabs him. That a non-samurai nation might perceive that not as a distinctive lacking a difference did not apparently occur to him. Due to the declaration of war being presented to Secretary of State Colonel Hull after the attack, the United States saw it as a dastardly sneak attack. On December 8th, FDR asked Congress to declare war on Japan by saying famously, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of the Japan. The distance of Hawaii from Japan makes it an obvious that the attack was deliberately planned many days or even weeks ago. During the interviewing time, the Japanese government was deliberately sought to deceive the United States by false statements and expressions of hope for continued peace. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people, in their righteous might, will win through absolute victory. The Senate voted 82 to 0. The House, 388 to 1. The lone dissenter vote was Jeanette Rankin, Republican of Montana, who only voted no in, war in, in World War I, making her the only person in Congress to vote against both, stating, as a woman, I cannot go to war. I refuse to send anyone else. She would also later quit. She had to vote no, so the world wouldn't see the United States as basically drunk on going to war. Really? The Aftermath of Pearl Harbor On December 11th, under the terms of the Tripartite Pact, Article 3, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States, which reciprocated by declaring war on them without debating the issue in Congress, unanimously except one voting president in each case, Rankin. 
On 19th December, military conscription is now extended to men ages 20 to 44. It is thought that Admiral Yamamoto stated, I fear that all we have done is awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. This has never been proven to be true. And the reluctant Admiral, Hiriki Agawa, gives a quotation from a reply by Admiral Yamamoto to Ogata Takatora on January 9, 1942, which is similar to the famous version. A military man can scarcely pride himself on having smitten a sleeping enemy. It is more a matter of shame, something for the one smitten. I would rather you made your appraisal after seeing what the enemy does, since it is certain that angered and outraged, it will soon launch a determined counterattack. It does give us some insight of the fear of Yamamoto in fighting the United States, especially since the declaration of war from Japan did not arrive until hours after Pearl Harbor was attacked. The Allies now included the United States, as well as the Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, China, and other nations. In 1941, the war was fought in six fronts, North Africa, Eastern Europe, the North Atlantic, China, Southeast Asia, and the Central Pacific. The Allies focused on defeating Germany first.